Hello and welcome to Creating a Human Rights Culture, which aims to promote a lived awareness of the interdependency and indivisibility of human rights principles in our minds, hearts, and bodies, that is, dragged into our everyday lives. What, after all, is freedom of speech to a person who is homeless and lives in a world at war? Therefore, it is dedicated ultimately to the application of the Human Rights Triptych, which in brief consists of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights at its center, the conventions, that is, international treaties on the right, and implementation measures on the left. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of Creating a Human Rights Culture, uh, which calls for a lived awareness of human rights principles in our minds and our hearts and dragged into our everyday lives or as St. John Paul II, he's a saint now, used to be Pope, said about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, it ought to be lived in letter and in spirit. So I'm here with the eminent Noam Chomsky, he's a humble guy, probably doesn't want to be referred to as eminent, but tough. And um, I want to get uh, your perspective on how you feel about um, social policies, broadly defined um, in the United States and perhaps elsewhere, as well as in the helping professions. Um, if I may, I wrote a book on it. I don't know, it's a little flaky to bring it up, I guess, sorry. And um, um, uh, how you feel our policies are in sync with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Before I get into that, I want to talk about the United Nations Charter, which is kind of a parent of the Universal Declaration. Uh, the UN Charter commits every nation state to full employment. Now, the United States delegation to the UN at the time, uh, when I say this, people can't believe me, they think it's some type of Marxist. The United States basically said um, um, employment means socially useful work, which contributes to the development of the human personality and increases, and increases purchasing power. So my question to you is, do you think the United States right now has work like that available to people, socially useful, contributing to the development of the human personality? I'm just wondering what your take is on that. And then I'm going to talk about the Universal Declaration. Well, I don't recall at the moment the origins of that passage, but I suspect it was Eleanor Roosevelt's influence. It was, definitely. Yeah. Well, but Eleanor Roosevelt stood out. She was kind of off the spectrum. She really did com commit herself in a dedicated way to uh, pursuing human rights and justice. She had yeah. a very positive impact on the whole New Deal system, and, and this was kind of a swan song. Uh, if you take a look at the Universal Declaration, which is supposed to kind of implement these ideas, the U.S. did sign it like yeah. everybody, but uh, tongue-in-cheek. Uh, there are three sector, sections to the UD, Universal yeah. Declaration. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about each uh, one, but if you want to bring it up. Well, okay. Well, one it's of them, the second section, is social and economic rights. Right. Uh, the U.S. has always rejected that. Like Article 25, which kind of spells out what you were just saying, it talks about education, health, uh, access, and so on. The U.S. simply rejects it. In fact, explicitly, uh, sometimes people are honest enough to say it, like uh, Gene Kirkpatrick in the Reagan administration just dismissed this as what you call the letter to Santa Claus. Uh, I remember Not that. to be taken seriously. Uh, Morris Abrams, uh, when he was <laughs> vetoing the right to development, uh, which is basically the same thing, said it's preposterous and incitement to... Uh, an, uh, empty just, was an empty vessel. It was an empty vessel. It was just, frankly, reject, flatly rejects it totally rejects the cultural rights of third part and has a dubious record on the first part the civil and economic rights. This shows up very clearly in the, uh, uh, what are called the enabling conventions. You know, the, in the UN system, you kind of pass a declaration and then there are supposedly conventions that right. are to implement it. Uh, the right side of the trend. And the US simply disregards them. As, uh, it's ratified very few, and the few that have been ratified always have reservations that exclude the United States, so basically nothing. That they're non-self-executing. Uh, non-self-executing, and that includes even things like the Genocide Convention or the Torture Conventions and so on. 
So the U.S. basically just disregards the Universal Declaration. Now you could regard that as a kind of a compliment because it simply means the U.S. is frank about rejecting everything. Uh, Saudi Arabia signs them too. I know. Do we take it seriously? Uh, but if we're talking about ourselves, the record is awful. Uh, as regards to employment, uh, there have been, in the 1940s, which was still under the impact of the popular forces, the radical labor movement, labor movement and so on, that pressed through New Deal legislation, there was kind of commitment to this. Uh, but under the business assault of the post-war period, it declined. Uh, there have been efforts, like there was the Humphrey Hawkins bill in I guess, 1979 or so, to uh, uh, try to, to call for full employment as a goal, and Carter, who was then president, watered it down so that it was just something to think about, but nothing that we do anything about. And uh, all of this is part of the, uh, this, uh, the kind of class war would be the right word for it, uh, carried out by the business world to try to beat back the uh, uh, progressive period of the New Deal and its uh, achievements for the benefit of the population, which uh, uh, terrified most of the business world. In fact, you look at the business press in the late 30s, it was full of uh, warnings about what they called the, the rising political power of the masses and the threat this poses to our system of what they call you know, Americanism, private property, and so on. And this shows up all over, even in uh, Take, going back to the Universal Declaration again, I guess it's Article 19, I think it is, which is on freedom of speech and yes, information. Yes, exactly, 18 and 19, one of the, so whatever, who knows. And the U.S. by comparative standards has quite a good record on freedom of speech, but that's an interesting uh, uh, resolution if you look at it. Uh, it. What it says is people should have the right to receive to Im and impart information received, meaning part of freedom of speech is the right of access to a range of information and uh, uh, news and opinion, access. There was a battle about this in the late 1940s in the United States with high-level commissions. We're still in the post-New Deal period, so there's a kind of a reflection of New Deal liberalism as opposed to the business world. And there, there was an interesting debate that took place in the late 40s where essentially the, the corporate world, what, what the, they wanted an interpretation of freedom of speech which just means freedom to impart. Uh, the liberal opposition uh, interpreted the way the UN does and the way the US officially did by signing, signing the UD, namely to receive, which means you have to have uh, a range of uh, uh, opinion available and presented. Actually, the founding fathers, if you go back to that, they believed in that too. And that's why we have things like uh, special postal rates for the journals and so on to, mm -hmm. to facilitate uh, freedom of uh, uh, access for all, for a range of opinions. Over the years, that's been sharply narrowed. Anyway, in the late 40s, the business world, of course, won. And that's, for example, why the United States doesn't have any significant uh, public, uh, public broadcasting, very marginal as compared to other countries. And not that it's so wonderful in other countries, I don't want to exaggerate, but the emphasis here is on freedom to control uh, opinion. It's called freedom of speech, but it's basically freedom to control on the part of concentrated power not an uh, opportunity of the population to have access to a wide range of opinion or even to participate in it. That's not considered freedom of speech. And uh, that goes all the way through, like when the Supreme Court, uh, Buckley v. Valio, when it uh, decides that money is speech. I know, yes. Okay, then we're off and running. The United but, States literally said that in their report to the yeah. Human Rights Commission. But I think, uh, but as for employment, of course, in answer to your question, obviously not. It's not even considered a, a, a condition, a, a, a principle that we should try to achieve. It's disregarded. 
Okay. And as far as uh, social policy is concerned, we have uh, uh, objective criteria. Take a look at the uh, OECD reports, the, you know, the reports of the, the rich countries, roughly 30 developed countries, the OECD. They have uh, detailed studies that regularly come out on all sorts of topics, and one of them is on social justice. Uh, of the, I think it's 31 OECD countries, the U.S. maybe is 27th or 28th, ranks alongside of Turkey and Greece, you know, yeah. as distinct from the rich developed countries in social justice. Okay, uh, thank you. I have some, some other questions sure. relating to the Universal Declaration, because um, uh, what people say uh, it uh, basically consists of five crucial notions, uh, human dignity, non-discrimination, civil and political rights, economic and social rights, as you mentioned, and solidarity rights. So um, I'll just go through them. I only have about maybe 15 minutes left or something. Sure, that's good. So I'd like to, uh, the first uh, article one, it talks about um, human, I'm sorry, it talks about human dignity, okay? So my question to you is, do you feel, and this isn't a comedy show, but, <laughs> Do you feel that our social uh, policies, uh, you touched on it briefly before, but uh, the helping and health professions, for example, um, do they treat people with human dignity? Is the psychiatric um, manual on dog, the DSM, um, does that help people? Is that a dignified way of viewing people? Or does it categorize people? Um, does it stigmatize people? Um, and in a broader sense, if you walk in a welfare, if a woman or not men do it, walk in a welfare office, um, are they treated with dignity? Um, children, are they treated that way? Um, is standardized testing and psychological testing a way to treat people with dignity? My, my question is, do the helping and health professions really incorporate dignity into their ways of doing things, or, or are people sort of charity cases to be helped? That's sort of saying a lot. It's just a general question. You know, I think that we have to say it varies. Okay. So among the actual practitioners, it's very often the case. So some of the most amazing people I've ever seen in my life are nurses in hospitals. Exactly. It's just, I mean, it's social it's yeah. it's pretty incredible what they do. So yeah, they, uh, not everyone, of course, but to a remarkable extent, they exemplify these uh, virtues. On the other hand, when you look at policy, no, it's not true. So take welfare. If a woman without employment and a child tries to get welfare, uh, first of all, you get in line. Uh, you have to get there somehow, you know, in the yeah. car. So you, you grab your kids and you get there. You wait outside, you know, there's a line, the fire closes, it's a time of the day, and so on. Uh, maybe a couple of days later, somebody will talk to you for a couple of minutes and uh, tell you, sorry, the welfare's gone, which it is. You know, Clinton killed the welfare system. Yeah. So now, get, get a job. You know, how, how do you get a job? And you got a couple of kids, you have no income. Well, you have no transportation. Uh, so you get a job uh, and washing dishes in a restaurant part-time. you got to get there. You have to take care of it. There's no daycare in the United States. Other countries, the developed countries, have pretty substantial daycare systems, uh, which are free and effective. The United States doesn't have them. So you've got to have some kind of daycare. You have to have transportation. You're not you're getting paid ridiculously low wages. Uh, maybe at the end of the day, you can get some milk to put on the table. Uh, that's treating people with dignity. And, uh, uh, is take standardized testing. Yeah. That's a way to train kids for the Marine Corps. It, it, obedience, passivity, regurgitate what you're told, don't think. That's what standardized testing means. In uh, yeah. decent educational institutions, of course you don't have it. Like that takes say where we are right now, it happens to be a research institution. And the idea of standardized testing would not even be a joke. You're trying to encourage students to question, to challenge, to, to create. To, they're supposed to be the people who will create the science or understanding of the future. It doesn't matter if they can repeat what you told them in class. Who cares about that? If they can do that, they're probably missing the point. In fact, one uh, 
famous physicist, world famous physicist, was well known for telling his freshman classes when they asked what, what's going to happen this semester, he would say, uh, it doesn't matter what we cover, it matters what you discover. That's education. And that goes right down to kindergarten, literally. I mean, experience it myself and see programs that work on it. So you can, from the very beginning, uh, direct an educational program towards the uh, and, uh, uh, impetus, developing, encouraging uh, the participants to develop their capacities. And it can also be interactive. Uh, Paulo Freire, the great educator, uh, yeah. continually emphasized that the teaching situation can be mutual. People are teaching each other, they're participating, they're developing ideas, curricula, and so on. Uh, doesn't mean it's anarchy. It doesn't mean you just do anything you feel like for a pain in the wall. It can be structured, but uh, structured in a way which uh, uh, is directed towards uh, ensuring that uh, children, students, uh, all the way up, will uh, uh, be able to develop their own capacities in their own ways in the most fulfilling form, in the way that will make them participants in a democratic community, which means solidarity, interaction, mutual support, and so on. And that can work. Actually, I've experienced it myself. It happens when my parents were Dewey uh -huh. and sent me to a Dewey experimental school run by Temple University, which had a progressive education department. It's exactly the way it was. I mean, I, didn't, I went there to, uh, till high school, and I literally didn't know until I got into an academic high school that I was a good student. <laughs> I mean, when I got into the academic high school, you know, everybody tracked, and I get third in the class or second in the class and all that. Then I realized all of a sudden I'm supposed to be a good student. But uh, also through school I didn't know. I mean, I skipped a grade, but nobody paid any attention, so I skipped a grade. But uh, uh, there was no ranking. There were tests, but they were to be informative. Uh, you know, is there something that should be done, let's say, in the height? Is there a gap that we should deal with? They were supposedly to be informative about how to, uh, to deal with the student and the, and the curriculum. Is something missing in the way things are being taught? Okay. So, for example, in first grade, uh, I was told, I don't really remember, but apparently the boys, in, in those days you taught reading in first grade, now it's earlier. And, uh, the boys in the first grade class didn't learn how to read. So the school and the parents figured something's wrong, you know. The tests showed that. And the girls learned, the boys didn't. And they looked into it and you could figure out what was going wrong. But, uh, so tests were used for purposes like that, but not to rank people. There was no ranking. Nobody was, you know, people, the kids did what they could and you worked together. Uh, it's perfectly feasible. In fact, there are educational programs for children being developed by very good, mostly in science education, being by very good scientists, some of them here, which are very imaginative and uh, just the way teaching ought to go. I mean, somebody was describing a couple of them to me recently. Uh, so for example, one, perhaps be for high school, was a program that be, uh, a, a section of a, a science class which begins by asking a question. How can mosquitoes fly in the rain? Now, if you start to think about that, it's kind of miraculous. Because a raindrop on a mosquito, if we had a comparable weight on us, we'd be crushed to the ground. Yeah. So how can a mosquito fly in the rain? Well, it's a challenging question. When you begin to think about it, you have to learn some physics. You have to learn some biology. You have to learn things about the amazing fact that flight is possible at all. Uh, pretty soon you're studying, you're uh, working into, you're, you're pressing the boundaries of understanding. And that seems like that can be done at every level, kindergarten on up. That's teaching. Uh, what is not teaching is, here's how a mosquito flies, copy it down, repeat it in the test. Uh, then, of course, you forget it two weeks later. We've all had that experience. That's regimentation, not teaching. Okay. Okay. Um. Thanks. I want to say we discussed human dignity. Another um, crucial notion of the Universal Declaration is non-discrimination. And basically it says that um, the 
Um, we don't care if you're black or white or poor or woman or man. You have a right to all these human rights that are enumerated in the Declaration. So my question to you is a general one. Again, this isn't a comedy show, but um, do the health, helping and health profession discriminate? Um, do we discriminate? Um, I know we obviously do. I know when I, when I went to college, I went to Brooklyn College, it was 95% white and we had free tuition. So as soon as you had African Americans coming in, they started charging tuition. So obviously that was a form of discrimination. So my question is if you could maybe say just a few words about how you feel society discriminates and or helping and health professionals. Well, the first thing we should recognize that as a result of really dedicated popular struggle, there have been improvements. So uh, up until the 1950s, there were literally lynchings going on in the South. Yeah. There's plenty of discrimination, but not lynching anymore. Uh, women's rights have improved considerably. Uh, gay rights have very recently been improved. Uh, the United States now gives lectures to other countries about how can you not uh, yeah. observe great gay. We look back at ourselves a couple of years ago. I mean, Oh, yeah. the anti-sodomy laws and so on. So there has been improvement in many respects. On the other hand, there's a legacy of discrimination which is so profound that it's a deep sickness in the society and has to be dealt with from the origins. I mean, uh, the first slaves were brought here 500 years ago. That's 500 years in which African Americans have barely escaped from slavery. Uh, there was literal slavery yeah. up till the Civil War. Uh, there was a brief period of freedom, 10 years. After that, 1877, North-South Compact uh, basically authorized the South to what it felt like. Uh, they essentially criminalized black not life and restored a slave labor force, except this time it was the government that paid for the slaves, not the slave owner, so that it even better for the slave owner, a large part of the uh, the early Industrial Revolution in the United States, uh, including the finance, uh, uh, manufacturing, uh, commerce, was based on the most vicious slavery that has ever existed in human history. Yeah. I mean, Southern slavery was just beyond description. But uh, the tech formally ended, then you got another period, uh, which lasted almost to the Second World War, where a large part of black life was just criminalized. Like if a black man was standing on a corner, he could be arrested for vagrancy, let's say, and given a fine which you couldn't pay, so he ends up staying in jail for the rest of his life and working in a steel mill for nothing. You know, uh, that, That's up to this almost the Second World War. Uh, after the Second World War, this is again the impact. It, it's only like the New Deal itself was deeply racist. Yeah, I, it was designed. It's, yeah, how it's in the book. Yeah, well, it was okay. designed that way in order to get the Southern Democrats to agree. Uh, the Roosevelt administration had to set up the program so that they were racist. So they excluded uh, the professions that were mostly African American or or Hispanic. You know, so agricultural workers, service workers, and maids, all the the non-white professions basically were excluded. A GI Bill, which was a wonderful thing, but it was racist. It was basically for whites. Uh, and, uh, yeah. But there was a period when there was a couple of decades when there was openings for African Americans. The period of substantial economic growth in the 50s and the 60s, before the whole neoliberal reaction took place. Uh, it was possible for a black man to get a union job in a auto plant and uh, have a decent uh, benefits and wages, buy a home, and so just get to college, that sort of thing. Uh, by, the, uh, by the 1970s, when the reaction begins to take place, all that gets wiped out again. And in fact, uh, right. something like Jim Crow was reestablished with criminalization of the black population, largely through the drug war, but other things which are very racist in its character. Oh, yeah. So here we have 500 years in which there's a couple of decades in which African Americans had a kind of a shot at getting into the main society. 
Well, of course, that leaves quite a residue. I mean, take a look at homicide statistics. Everybody's upset correctly at the fact that it's very high in black ghettos. Yeah. Why? Do they have different genes? No. It's 500 years to explain that. Arthur Jensen. And that has to be, uh, uh, that, yeah, we'll skip that. Well, but, yeah, that has, yeah. but that, but, you know, uh, uh, we have to face, unless we can at least face the facts, uh, we're not going to do anything about them. It's a deep cultural illness. And it's worth mentioning that Europe is probably worse. I've always felt that racism is worse in Europe than here. It's just that the societies are kind of homogeneous, so it doesn't show. So, say in Denmark, if everybody's blonde and blue-eyed, we're not racist. So if you get a tiny percentage of the population is Muslim, all of a sudden it blows up. Uh, to the point where in Austria, uh, the neo-fascist uh, uh, party runs 50-50 in the elections, just because they have a couple of thousand immigrants. You gotta go. Okay. Um, well, all right. One last thing. No. Yeah. Okay, you gotta go. Um, um, you discussed civil and political rights and economic social rights. There's also solidarity rights that people don't talk about that much, but it talks about um, that governments have a duty to cooperate with one another. So you can talk about a clean environment, self determination, global distributive justice. That the rich country, that the poor countries of the world have the right to the wealth of the rich nations. I'm just wondering how you feel the United States does on that, and then I'll let you go. Okay. Well, there's something Thank you. Very there are many great. aspects Thanks. of this, but one is of overriding significance because the fate of the species depends on it. That's the attitude towards environmental catastrophe. And what is happening in the world today is so surreal that you can't find words to describe it. I mean, this is the richest and most powerful country in world history. We're in the middle of a primary right now, two yeah. parties. The Democrats, a couple of phrases here and there. We have to make a decision right now as to whether organized human life is going to continue, literally. Yeah. Uh, and the effects will be felt significantly within decades. It's not far off. In fact, we already see them. So it, nothing like this has ever happened in human history, the most important question ever. Democratic side, a couple of phrases. Republican side, quite a lot. Every single candidate says, it's not happening. Doesn't matter, the world is flat, because I want it to be flat. Okay. Every candidate, there was actually one case who said, yeah, it's happening, but we shouldn't do anything about it. That's even worse. That's the richest, most powerful country in the world. They go to the poorest country in South America, Bolivia. They're in the lead in dealing, in trying to, even in legislation and in action, trying to do something about this impending catastrophe. Yeah. Why? Because there's a majority indigenous population. Yeah. And in fact, you look around the world, it's the tr indigenous people who are in the lead. The rich, developed, educated, and so on, are not only in the back, they're trying to draw us backwards. It's, and these are questions about, of literal survival. It's the kind of, again, you just can't find words to describe it as so out loud. Yeah, indigenous people are great. I, we're getting a mess of your boss over there. <laughs> indigenous people are, I lived in Alaska a while, wonderful people. That no, was great to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Oh, maybe I'm going to bug in a year or two. Please do. Thank you. Let's be good.